Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everybody as we know Sarala did not translate Vyasa Mahabharata Sarala retold it by retold uh, we mean that he added episodes which did not exist in Vyasa Mahabharata he deleted episodes that occurred in Vyasa Mahabharata. He modified some episodes. By modified, we mean he expanded some of them and contracted some of them. And he, he on the whole, he reconceptualized Vyasa Mahabharata and wrote it in Odia. Now, this retailing is not something new to the Mahabharata, uh, the Mahabharata tradition or the, the, the retelling is not something that is new when we think of the tradition of the Mahabharata narration. It is said that uh, Vyasa told the story of the Mahabharata in just four slokas. Later, Narada expanded it to a text of 30 lakh slokas. It is said that Shuka, there are others in between, and then uh, Shuka contracted it, reduced the 30,000 slokas into 14, and then Vaishampana reduced the 14 lakh slokas into just 1 lakh and it is Vaishampayana's version that goes by the name of Vyasa Mahabharata that is one tradition. So, there are actually uh, not just Vyasa wrote the original or Vyasa composed the original, but there are others who were retailers. It is just that the, the Vaishampayana's text also goes by the name of Vyasa. So, what we call Vyasa Mahabharata, from the point of view of this tradition, it is actually Vaishampayana's retelling of Mahabharata, which was originally composed by Vyasa. So, this retelling is not new to the composition of Mahabharata. So, when Vyasa Mahabharata was retold in Vasas in, 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 in different Vasas uh, like Odia, like Marathi, like Bengali, like Telugu, Tamil, Kannada. When, uh, when, when it was retold, then the poets took considerable freedom in retelling the story. So, taking freedom with the basic narrative is not something new, it is a part of the tradition. In fact, uh, I, I must tell you that uh, there, was an, there, is an, there, is an, there is an there is an alternative tradition to the composition of uh, concerning the composition of the Mahabharata, in which Narada and Vaishampayana etc. do not figure. It is said that the 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 first text in this respect was called Jaya, where Jaya means victory. And then Jaya was expanded, Jaya was composed in just 8000 slokas. Now, Jaya was expanded to Bharata and Bharata was composed in 24000 slokas. Now, Mahabharata is composed in 1 lakh slokas. So, this is an alternative tradition and all these are attributed to Vasa. So, surely 
Vyasa was not an individual. So we are not talking about Vyasa as an individual. We are talking about probably a title of uh, poets, uh, who uh, probably a title, and uh, probably a title of the of many poets, and the title was Vyasa. So let us not go into those things. We say that uh, going by tradition, we say that Vyasa Mahabharata was composed in one lakh uh, slokas. Uh, in one tradition, uh, as, as I just mentioned, it was Vaishampayana, whose work goes by Vyasa Mahabharata. In another, it is Vyasa Mahabharata, composed by Vyasa. So now, uh, Sarala has retold Vyasa's story following the same uh, approach as uh, had been followed earlier in the composition of the text. So, uh, if uh, Vyasa Mahabharata <coughs> contains uh, one lakh slokas, as it is claimed to do, Sarala Mahabharata contains one lakh forty thousand padas. Roughly, we can translate both pada and sloka roughly as couplets. So, from one point of view, in terms of the number of uh, couplets, Vyasa Mahabharata uh, is forty thousand couplets. Uh, smaller than uh, um, Sarala Mahabharata. But that does not really mean much uh, because there are lots of uh, uh, um, there are lots of considerations. Uh, what is what can be said in a very compressed way in Sanskrit cannot be said in that compressed manner in uh, Uriya. Therefore, uh, the, therefore these numerical differences do not really matter. They do not really explain anything very seriously. But in any case, so there have been, uh, so this is there, this is clear uh, that there have been episodes, uh, Sarala has added episodes which did not exist in the earlier, in the earlier, uh, in Vasa Mahabharata and he has deleted episodes and uh, from what, uh, what were there in Vasa Mahabharata. Now, today let us look at some of the episodes that he has added. Uh, by now we have also we, by now we have referred to episodes uh, where or uh, episodes in Vasa Mahabharata which Sarala in his retelling uh, modified like the beginning of the war. So we know the account was something in Vasa Mahabharata, the account is something else in Sarala Mahabharata. So it is a modified version. So the same uh, episode exists but treated differently. And we looked at uh, um, you know the same thing with respect to Draupadi, Draupadi's disrobing, uh, and we have we have been doing it. And the second game of dice, how the second game of dice was played. So we have mentioned these episodes and have discussed them in some depth to show how Sarala reconceptualized and retold the episodes. Now we are saying we, now today we are dealing with some episodes which were not there in Vasa Mahabharata at all. And one of these is the quarrel between, between Hidimbi or Hidimbika as uh, she is called in uh, Sarala Mahabharata and Draupadi. Now Hidimbika or Hidimbi was the, was the, dem, was the demoness wife of uh, Bhima. So Bhima had married a demoness. And uh, the name of that demoness is uh, Hidimba or Hidimbaki as uh, Hidimbaki. And they had a child, the name of the child was Ghatotkacha. So Ghatotkacha was the, uh, when, when Ghatotkacha uh, became young, uh, he became the king of, uh, the, uh, the, he became the king of a forest kingdom. And when he became the king, his mother, who had looked after him, that is uh, Hidimbiki, she knew that uh, she had uh, anointed him king following the Aryan tradition. Because Bhima was an Aryan, Arja, and Bhima was the father. So, although she was an Asuri, so she followed and uh, she did not belong to the belong to the Arja tradition, but an Arja tradition, she anointed her son. Ghatotkacha, uh, the king of that forest kingdom, following the rituals 
as uh, required in the RJ tradition. And the child knew, uh, her son knew what the, uh, what the RJ tradition and what the RJ cultures, what the RJ modes of thinking are. He knew that, she had, she had taught them uh, all this. Uh, she had, uh, so the child was aware of, uh, so her son was aware of both, both traditions, the Osuric tradition and also the Arya tradition, Arja tradition. So he knew both. Now, Yudhishthir was performing Rajasya Yajna. Vyasa was the Purohit. He was the priest who was to conduct that Yajna. The main priest was to conduct that Yajna. And uh, uh, the, you know, the auspicious moment came. Yudhishthira was sitting with Draupadi and, uh, uh, and there are many and, and, the, and there are many other rishis who were uh, participating in the conduct of the yajna and many rishis came as on, came as guests visitor, uh, came as guests then there were there were his brothers and and many and, and many other duryodhana and uh, kauravas and so many others so, so many were there who had come now no matter how much they tried no matter how many mantras they chanted, no matter how, how much uh, ghee they poured, nothing would happen. The fire of the homo, the homo fire would not burn. The homo fire did not emerge. So uh, they were worried. What was happening? Did something inauspicious take place? But Vasa said, no, there was no problem like that. There was nothing inauspicious. It is just that Yudhisthir does not have a son. So a son has to be, so, so, the, so, the, uh, so the person who is conducting this, uh, the, the person, on, the person uh, who is uh, performing this uh, yajna, Rajasri yajna, that person must have a son. The jajman must have a son. That, the word that was used was jajman. The jajman must have a son. Yudhisthir was the jajman and he didn't have a son, therefore the fire would not burn. So what does one do then? Yudhisthira was advised by the sages that Vima had a son of the five Pandavas. Vima only, Vima alone had a son, and if Vima's son came, that would amount to uh, Yudhisthira's son having come, and uh, the fire would burn, the fire would emerge, yajna fire would emerge. Now there is a, there is a uh, there is a certain story behind this as to how although the Pandavas uh, were five different uh, uh, persons, in some sense they were connected by some uh, in some way they were connected, and it was as though there was one who had distributed himself into five and resided in part in each of them. We don't. We need not go to that story here. That is not necessary for our purpose. But there is a story which which shows how, when Vima's son came, how come it was taken as the Yudhishthira's son that I arrived. So logically, the only thing is you connect them somehow. That the same thing had divided itself into five different uh, into into five different parts, and each part resided in one Pandava. So that is a logical one logical way of dealing with this and that was done and that is what Sarla, that is what Sarla's story is but we, don't, we, we are not concerned with that story here. So the fire burned but then how, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, so, so, the, so if this was advised to do this, sorry, if this was advised to do this and uh, Vima was told to invoke his son uh, Ghatotkacha. And Vima did that. So Ghatatkacha knew that his father was uh, invited, his father had invoked him and his father wanted him to go to the Rajasri Yajna. So he told his mother, Hidimbaki, that father wants me to go to Rajasri Yajna and I will go. Hidimbaki says, go, but do the following. When you go there, you first pay your respects to your father, Bhima. Next, you pay your respects to Krishna. Then bow to Vyasa and then to Yudhisthira. Period. 
Ghatot Kacha knew that uh, Draupadi had not been named. Draupadi was born out of the sacred fire and she was a Brahmin, uh, she, she, she was a Brahmin born and born out of sacred fire. So how could she not be paid respect to? That was the doubt in his mind and he was afraid. He was afraid that he might be cursed. Now, Hidimbaka, the mother, his mother could figure it out and said that uh, you are scared of uh, Draupadi. So, do not worry, I will come with you. So, what she did was, she did not go with him really in that sense. Uh, he entered in, in he entered uh, in, 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 he entered the, uh, the space where he entered the area where the uh, Radhashri Agni was being held and she was waiting outside. Nobody knew that he, she had come. So, Ghatat Kata went inside and he did exactly as his mother had told him to do. Draupadi uh, and uh, Draupadi was extremely upset. It, uh, she felt that Ghatatkacha had humiliated her in public. So, she cursed him. She said that you, uh, uh, you have listened to your mother and uh, your mother was an ignoramus, your, your mother is an ignoramus and you are an ignoramus too. So, so uh, you have disrespected me, I curse you. You, you, you know who I am. I am Yudhishthira's wife. I am born out of, uh, I, 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 am, I am a Brahmin born and I am born out of the sacred fire, who, uh, sacred yajna. So, I curse you. So, uh, so you, uh, since you have uh, uh, humiliated me in public, I curse you. And what was the curse? It was a terrible curse actually. Uh, Ghatatkacha was a Kshatriya. So, the curse was that Ghatatkacha would be killed without fighting. He will be, uh, Ghatatkacha would be killed in the battlefield when he was not fighting. So, to be killed in the battlefield without, uh, when one is not fighting was something considered to be extremely degrading, degenerating uh, for a Kshatriya. That was a very, that was a terrible way of dying. Uh, the dignified way of dying is go to the battlefield, fight and die. You win or you die. So, dying in the battlefield, fighting is considered, was considered to be glorious and uh, true and, and uh, that was the death that, that Kshatriya was, uh, Kshatriya considered, uh, um, you know, uh, proper, uh, that, that was the death that, that the Kshatriya uh, thought uh, was honorable. But, he was cursed to die without fighting when he was not fighting in the battlefield. That was a very degrading kind of uh, death that uh, uh, she had uh, uh, cursed him uh, uh, with. Uh, now, Hidimbaki, who was waiting outside, heard uh, what she had said. So, she rushed into the yajna area and shouted at Draupadi. She said, my son has been anointed king following the Arya tradition. He is the king. He is not supposed to bow to a fallen woman. You are an Asati. You are an Asati. You have five husbands. This is not the tradition of the Aryas. And my son, who is the king, cannot bow was not expected to bow to a fallen woman like you and I curse you. And he said and she said, you haven't, you, you, you have no issue right now. You don't have any sons, you don't have any issue, but someday you will have children and I curse your children. The unborn children I curse, they will all die young. So, they cursed each other. Uh, Bhima's son would die and so would Draupadi's children. Now, everybody kept, there was, a, there was a lull in the hall. Among the, uh, among the assembled, there was a complete lull. The two women had cursed each other 
and had destroyed uh, each other's children by through that curse. Now Krishna asked Vasa, Vasa, look at your text and see how this is going to materialize. So what Vasa did was he opened his pothi, he opened his text and told Krishna how Draupadi children will be killed and how Ghatotkasa will be killed. Talking about Ghatotkasa, he said that uh, in the text it is written that uh, Karna, uh, Karna Shakti would kill him when he would be, uh, when he would not be fighting. Details do not concern us, sometime maybe we will be, you know, we'll talk. maybe one, uh, maybe I can tell you the details what happened here. Karna had got a Shakti, a, a kind of very powerful divine power and uh, uh, it, it had the form of, it had the form of a spear and, and the appropriate mantra has to be invoked and the spear would become a terrible Shakti and then whoever Arjuna wanted to kill with that Shakti, that Shakti would go and kill. It is an unfailing Shakti. You know, whoever is the target, the Shakti would hit. Nothing can stop it. So Karna had reserved it for Arjuna. And during their fight, uh, one uh, one day during their fight, uh, when Drona was the commander in chief, during their fight, Karna threw that arrow at Arjuna. Now what Krishna did was. Before Krishna, Krishna knew what Karna was doing, so Krishna asked um, Ghatotkacha to go behind Arjuna's chariot. And Ghatotkacha, nobody ever uh, questioned Krishna. Why are you saying this was not something that anybody ever asked Krishna? Whatever he said, people agreed to, you know, without any questioning. It was rarely that uh, there was a discussion with Krishna as, with respect to um, the logic of his stand or with respect to why he was saying what he was saying very, very rarely. But otherwise, if he said something, it was done. So Ghatatkacha in, in pure surrender to Krishna's words went behind Arjuna's chariot. And when that Shakti was thrown at Arjuna, what Krishna did was he removed the chariot and Ghatatkacha was exposed to the Shakti and the Shakti killed Ghatatkacha and he died. So, this is how Draupadi's curse was, uh, Draupadi's curse materialized. He died without fighting. And uh, the story of uh, Draupadi's children we already have uh, told in this uh, course, so we do not have to recount that. Now, uh, this is one story, the quarrel between Ghatotkacha and uh, uh, the quarrel between Gandhari, uh, I am sorry, the quarrel between Draupadi and uh, uh, Hidimbi. Now this, to repeat, uh, does not occur in Vasa Mahabharata. This is Sarala's addition. Consider another story. This time the quarrel between Kunti and Gandhari. Uh, uh, both of both Kunti and Gandhari used to go to a to a particular Shiva temple to worship Shiva. Uh, that was their uh, re, that was their everyday ritual. So, um, so one day, one day um, Gandhari discovered that the temple where she was going to worship Shiva was also the temple where Kunti used to come to worship Shiva. Kunti used to have her bath in the river and uh, worship uh, and come to the temple and worship Shiva and worship Shiva before Gandhari arrived. That was a normal thing, that was, that was a daily thing. But one day Kunti was late. So when Gandhari came, Kunti was in the temple worshipping Shiva. And when Gandhari found this, she was furious. Kunti's husband was dead, Pandu was no more, so Kunti was a widow and was powerless. And Gandhari's husband, Dhritarashtra, was the king of Hastinapura, and so she was the empress. So, how dare Kunti worship in the same temple where, uh, uh, where she offered her worship? So, she shouted at Kunti 
and Kunti responded. But then Mahadev, Bhagavan Mahadev materialized. He told Kunti and uh, Gandhari that, look, we, we, nobody is dear to us. So don't fight. We, nobody is dear to us. If you give us gifts, we are yours. Otherwise, no. We don't belong to anybody. So you give us, you give us whatever we want and then, you know, you, we are yours. Now, what is it that, what is that Shiva wanted? Shiva said by tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning when you come to worship, bring a champak flower made of gold. So that is what he said and disappeared. So Kunti was very upset and Gandhari was of course elated because Gandhari was the queen and getting a, a champak flower was no problem for her. Getting a golden champak flower was no problem for her. She could get it immediately. All the treasury, the state treasury was in her hands. It was in the hands of Dhritarashtra and gold was not a problem for her. But there was nothing. Kunti was poor in the sense that she had nothing, no possessions that way. Uh, wh where would she get golden uh, champaks? And uh, um, so she was upset. And her children uh, found their mother upset. So they said, so they told, so they asked Kunti, Kunti, mother, what is it that is bothering you? So Kunti said, uh, children, don't worry yourselves. This is how it is. We cannot do anything. So Shiva will not be pleased with me and Shiva will be pleased with Gandhari. Arjuna said, this is a non-problem. What is this uh, big deal about uh, a golden champak? I will get you golden champak in thousands. Now Kunti was wondering, what was the child, what was, his, what was her child saying? What Arjuna did was, Arjuna told, her, what, you know, Arjuna told her mother that as, you, as always you go and have your bath before Gandhari comes and, has, and takes her bath, you go and have your bath and go and worship and you will see the champa clouds will be there. Indra shot, uh, that morning Arjuna shot an, uh, shot an arrow at uh, the treasury of uh, Indra and a thousand uh, uh, golden uh, flowers, golden champak flowers showered on, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, the showered uh, in the temple. So they fell, from, uh, they, they fell from the sky as rain falls in showers from the sky and then filled the entire, uh, comp entire temple compound with golden champakas. And when Gandhari came to have her, uh, she came and had her bath and when she entered the temple, she found the entire temple was full of golden champakas and there was no, she did, she, there was no place where she could put her foot even. All place, uh, everything was full of champakas. All space was full of champakas. So Gandhari was embarrassed and was afraid. For the first time, uh, real fear uh, assailed Gandhari. She knew that her sons, her, her husband and the Kuru king uh, and uh, the power of the Kurus is nothing in comparison with the power of Kunti's children. So, for the first time, she got afraid of Kunti. Let us uh, consider one more episode. This involves Kunti and Madri. Uh, Kunti and Madri are the two wives of Pandu. Kunti was his first wife, Madri the second. Now, we do not have to go into that story and that story is common uh, in both uh, Vyasa and uh, um, Sarva. Uh, Pandu was cursed. He earned a curse um, that if she had union with a woman, then he would die. So he could not have union with Kunti or with Madri. So he was he was issueless. We know that Kunti had a son before her wedding, and that son we know came to be known as Karna later, and that story is well known. We have also mentioned uh, 
we have also talked about Karna and Kunti uh, in an earlier episode. You remember how uh, Kunti took uh, Abhima, uh, Kunti took register of Abhima and Arjuna to Karna when she knew where Karna was growing up and how Karna took offense because Kunti had called her, uh, Kunti had called her, uh, called Yudhishthira, Jujesti. Jujesti, uh, he thought that Jesti means the eldest, Jujesti. And because, and she said that, and he said that you have called, you, although you know that I was alive, that she really did not know. She said that although I was, I was alive, I, although I was the first born, you called Yudhishthira, Jujesti, that is you called her the eldest, and until he dies, I cannot be your eldest. And then Kanti was upset, and then they came back. So we 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 know that episode. You know, this is merely uh, reminding you about what we had said. Now, so Kunti had uh, you know so so as uh, um, so so Kunti uh, knew about this mantra. Durbasa had given her that mantra. He, she could invoke anyone and any god and get a child. And that is how she got Yudhishthira. So uh, she took the permission of uh, Pandu, her husband, and the sages also had advised her to go for an issue. And she went for, uh, she invoked uh, God Dharma, and Yudhishthira was born. But Yudhishthira, she noticed that Yudhishthira, the child, was extremely kind-hearted, compassionate, and compassionate. And she knew that one who is so full of daya and dharma and, and daya and dharma could simply not be the king the king must be little the king must be uh, sometimes stone hearted now yudhishthira was extremely kind and generous and compassionate so she knew that if yudhishthira had to be the king then he had to be supported by strong uh, by a strong brother so she invoked god pavana and from god pavana wind god, she got Bhima. But she noticed that, uh, that, Bhima, uh, that Bhima didn't have a very sharp uh, vision. You know, Bhima was not very sharp in his mind. His perceptions were rather crude. So she concluded that Bhima might be a very mighty, uh, might grow up to a very mighty uh, person, but, she could, uh, but he could never be an archer. The kind of eagle vision that uh, that uh, that a great archer needed, Bhima simply did not have have that. He was very crude in his perceptions. Therefore, she thought that Bhima was not uh, the Bhima could not protect Yudhishthira. Uh, she needed one more child, who she thought would be able to protect Yudhishthira alongside Bhima. And then she invoked God Indra, the the God of Gods. So Indra gave her Arjuna, and she was happy. And she was not inclined to have any other children, because that system uh, did not, that system would not allow somebody to have more children than necessary. She already had, she had in some sense violated that system by going for the second and the third, uh, for, sec for her second and third child. She had already violated it. She did not want to do for, uh, and 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 that to, and going uh, and asking for more or trying to get more would simply be a violation of that code. That code was called Niyoga. We do not have to go into details of what Niyoga was, how Niyoga started, what Bhagavan Parshuram had done, uh, and how after that uh, the society had to answer a certain kind of need, and how it came up with the system of Niyoga, all this uh, we do not have to go into. Uh, in any case, so she thought that uh, she, she, it would be it would be sinful if she went for another child. So that was how it was. And one day, Sage Agasti visited them. And Sage Agasti told Kunti that Kunti, now since you have three children, give that mantra and that and the, and the garland that uh, Durbasa had given you, give that to Madri. Your uh, uh, you give that to Madri. Uh, so Kunti, uh, uh, then Kunti, Kunti was willing. She herself did not have any children, and Madri had served her very affectionately, and served her very sincerely and diligently. So she was pleased with Madri. So she had no problem sharing sharing that mantra and that garland with Madri. So she, uh, uh, 
uh, but what happened was um, Kunti, Kunti asked says Agaste, uh, he is called says Agastya in, uh, in other versions, but in uh, Sarala's version he is, consist, he is called both says Agastya and much more frequently Agasti. So, says Agasti, uh, she asked says Agasti, how did you know about the mantra? How did you, how did you know about Durvasa's garland? And Agastya's answer was, I knew because I have created this. This is interesting. Agasti said that he had created that. He used the word uh, sarjana. He used, the, he, he used the appropriate form of the word sarjana, that is created. So, he had created the story, he had created the narrative. And Kunti was surprised and uh, Agasti said, look you want to know more, so I will tell you more. So, he said what, what was going to happen in future. What is interesting uh, from our point of view is that Agasti claims that he was the author of the story. Of the, uh, he was the author of the story. Now, in the earlier case, when, when Krishna asked Vasa, now open your uh, pothi and, and tell us what, uh, how Draupadi's curse would materialize and how, got, and how Hidimba's curse would materialize, Vasa had opened his pothi. So, who is the author? Is it Vasa or is it Agasti? Or were there multiple traditions in which different, uh, you know, in which uh, different sages were considered to be authors? You know, we leave this question uh, unanswered. Uh, of this, uh, we, in in, in, in Sala Mahabharata, Vasa is, okay, Vasa is also referred to be uh, the author of the original version of Mahabharata and here Agasti. Um, so, uh, so, we leave the matter here. Uh, maybe there are, uh, as, as I said, maybe uh, Mahabharata was composed in different traditions in this country, in different, in different parts of the country and different uh, rishis were invoked, as uh, different rishis were named as author. We leave the matter uh, unanswered. But it is interesting to note this. It is interesting to note that uh, what, uh, it is interesting to note that what was happening was only an enactment of what was to happen. Uh, it is not that the, you know, the story had already been told and all these persons were actually actors on the stage doing their or acting um, or enacting their roles and the roles were assigned, pre-assigned roles. We come to another story and this is about Princess Amba's revenge. Um, and this story is pretty different. It, it, this story is quite different. Uh, this story is quite new in the context of, uh, this story is quite new in Sarala. It, uh, it, it doesn't exist in Vasa Mahabharata. Now, uh, Amba Vishma want, uh, when Chitrabiriya and Vis, uh, um, Amba want, Vishma wanted to marry Amba. Two of Amba's sisters had already been married to two of his brothers and Amba had remained unmarried. Uh, she actually wanted to marry someone else. In any case, uh, Vishma's two brothers had been married to two sisters of Amba, Ambika and Ambalika and uh, uh, Amba was unmarried. So, Bhishma sent word to her father that uh, why do not you uh, give, uh, why do not you give Amba in marriage to me. What her father had decided to do by then was to have a swambara for Amba. Uh, Amba was to marry, uh, Amba, Amba, Amba was uh, attracted towards uh, Salva and wanted to marry Salva and a Swambar was, uh, was something that would probably legitimize that. So, Salva would come and other kings would come and she would choose Salva. But surely other kings did not know this or probably her father also did not know this. 
but uh, her father was uh, organized her father was conducting a, uh, was organizing a swayambara for her now when this is when vishnu sent word that when he heard about the swayambara he sent word he said why don't you give amba in marriage to me and uh, so when uh, her father knew that vishnu was interested in her in her in his daughter's hand uh, he he didn't know what to do with the swambara things would come and would they not feel uh, humiliated in any case when the kings heard and the princess heard that vishnu was interested in amba nobody came to swambara they all returned and even salu returned he was coming but he also returned was everyone was scared of vishnu there was no one compare com, there was no one who could be compared to vishnu uh, in terms of uh, and vishnu was the greatest warrior there was no one who, who was a who could be a competitor to him there was no equal to vishnu so everyone was afraid and no one came so he went and uh, you know sort of uh, but when vishnu uh, yeah so 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 vishnu dressed himself in the bridal uh, i mean in the, in the dress of the bridegroom uh, he uh, he he had already uh, so he had, so he had already dressed himself uh, in the in the bridegroom's dress and at the auspicious moment he was going to start then he found his father shantanu when he went to seek shantanu's blessings before he started for amba's house he found uh, Shantanu upset. He was a very uh, he was an intelligent son and a very wise son, a person who was uh, uh, spiritually evolved and had a, and had a very keen sense of discrimination. Uh, was intelligent, so uh, he could sense that his father was not very happy. So he asked his father, "What was the reason?" His father said. that look there is a curse on me and the curse is from vishma's mother and his former wife ganga his wife ganga and uh, the curse was that vishma's uh, child would kill him now notice uh, uh, the you, let us recall in very brief uh, what happened in uh, sala mahabharata in, in vasa mahabharata uh vishma uh, when, when santanu wanted to marry satyavati who was a fisher uh, man's daughter mm, he could not he couldn't express his desire to marry satyavati because uh, uh, because the conditions that the, her father has imposed on him and one of the conditions was that one of the conditions actually one of the conditions was that her son would become the king and um and uh, yeah one of the one yeah one of the one of the conditions involved uh, that uh, vishma must have no children because shantanu may agree that uh, her son would become the king but what guarantee was there that later vishma children would not want to take over kingship so uh, he had said the fisher man's uh, the fisher woman's daughter had uh, sorry the fisher the fisher man had said that he would not give his daughter in marriage until uh, these conditions are fulfilled and when vishma knew this that we all know he took an oath solemn oath that he would never marry so that the question of his children ever claiming uh, their right on the throne of hastinapur that situation would never arise so that was how, that was how vishnu remained on marad here it is not the same story here it is a different story he was going he had already dressed himself in the bridal in in the, in the bridegroom's clothes but when he found his father unhappy asked what so his father said that uh, his son would kill him and vishma immediately you know threw those garlands which he was wearing and all the bridegroom's dress that he was wearing he threw them 
He said, he said that I'm not, I'm not going to marry because I don't want my son to kill my father. And in this story, in, 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 in this story, Shantanu never married again. There was no Satyavati after Ganga in Shantanu's life here. And there are no conditions on, uh, on him. But uh, there are no conditions for marriage uh, 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 with Satyavati on him. The Satyavati was not uh, associated with, uh, with uh, Shantanu. He didn't have a second, he didn't have a wife after Ganga. Uh, but here, um, sorry, uh, unlike in uh, Vasa Mahabharata. So the situations are entirely different. The situations leading to Vishma's uh, taking that oath against marrying, that situation didn't obtain here, but it is a different situation. In any case, Vishma, um, so Vishma decided not to marry. Now, what would happen to the girl? You know, the, the girl was to marry Vishma. Now, Vishma was unwilling to marry. What would happen to the girl? So, and Salvo was no more interested. So, Salvo said that Vishma already wanted to marry you. Uh, Vishma wanted to marry you. So, whether he married you or not, you, you, I cannot marry you now. So, Salvo was not interested in marrying her. So, she could neither go to, so she had no one. And her father was very worried. And her father brought her and left her in Vishma's palace saying that uh, from now on this is your home, look after Vishma and live your life. And saying this he left. And the poor girl, she came, she came there absolutely unwanted and she did not know what to do. But she was a, but Amba was a good, uh, was a good, uh, was a virtuous human being. And she lived there and did everything that could please Vishma. He looked after him. She looked after him. She took care of him with great devotion without any expectation. That is what she had done. That is what she was doing. So slowly what was happening was that Vishma was feeling a sense of love towards her, an attachment towards her. She was so virtuous. And she had taken so care, so much care of him that it that Vishma started feeling a sense of attachment towards her. And Vishma was worried because he knew that a time may come if this if this continued, a time may come when he would propose wedding with her. I mean, he, he would not be able to control himself, and uh, you know, I mean. Um, so he might uh, fall a prey to his desire. So he would either. He, he, so, so, so fearing this, one day he asked uh, his uh, attendants to throw Amba out of the palace. So they threw Amba out. Poor Amba did not understand what, why this thing had happened. She had no idea that Vishnu was feeling inclined towards her. That Vishnu was already, you know, kind of feeling a sense of deep attachment towards her. She had no idea. And poor innocent woman, one fine morning, she was thrown out. And and thrown out quite rudely. She didn't know what to do. Parsurama tried to help her, but did not succeed. So she went to Prague and uh, took Jal Samadhi, sacrificed herself in the waters of the, in the sacred waters of uh, uh, the river with the wish that she would be the cause of Vishma's destruction. And that was also the boon that Shiva had given him. So Shiva told him, uh, sorry, that was the boon that Shiva had given her. And Shiva had told her that although she would not be able to kill Vishma herself, she would be the cause of her death. No, she would be the cause of his death. And after that, she sacrificed herself in the waters of the, waters of the river, sacred river. And was reborn as Shikhandi. And Shikhandi's story, uh, we did not go into any detail here. Uh, she, she was not born a male. 
and uh, how and, and how it was discovered, what kind of embarrassments it caused, and what kind of problems it caused, we we skip. And uh, by the by the grace of a Gandharva, uh, she became she 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 attained her manhood. Then she became a man. But Vishma knew who Shikhandi was. Vishma knew that Shikhandi was no other than Amba. And he knew the purpose of her birth. And uh, uh, and Amba also had some. Amba also knew uh, what uh, why she was born. Or at least uh, either she knew or she was told. But in any case, uh, uh, Amba was not entirely unaware, unaware of her relationship with Vishma. Mm. So this is a story that shows that karma phala pursues you relentlessly. If not, I mean, if you do not experience the phala of the karma in one birth, it can pursue you to the next. It can pursue you to the next, next, next. Vishma had Vishma had been very unfair to her. Vishnu was feeling passionate towards her, but that, for that she was not responsible. She did not do anything to try and entice him. She was only doing her, uh, doing what her father asked her to do. So it was not her fault. So Vishma had Vishma humiliated her and punished her for no fault of hers, and that was he was simply afraid of himself. But that was Vishma's karma. It was an adharmic karma. And the phala he had to endure. In that life he could not endure. He, in that life he could not experience that phala. He had to wait. And but that karma pursued him to the next life, when uh, he had to suffer the consequences of what he had done. But Vish, uh, we will come to you know how Vishwa sort of faced that situation and what he did. Uh, that's you know, let's not go into that uh, today. So what does it mean? Uh, it, uh, what we have, you know, what we have found is that Vishma. Uh, what uh, uh, this story is important for us to understand the nature of karma and karma phala, and how karma phala continues. How how there is no escape from karma and karma phala unless there is moksha from the cycle of life and death, the the karmic cycle. In other words, the karmic cycle. There is no escape. So this is uh, um, this is um, this is the uh, this is the Amba story, the story of Amba's revenge. When uh, a storyteller who is retelling uh, an existing story adds to those stories or adds to the existing story, then one question that naturally arises is. Um, is there a narrative purpose to those stories, or do the stories exist in the new narrative for their own sake? So interesting stories. Somebody uh, writes. Somebody uh, write. Somebody composes interesting stories and just puts them there. Is it like that? Does a story exist in the narrative for its own sake, or this incorporated story performs a narrative purpose? Now we find that all of these stories perform narrative purposes uh, in the sense that each of these is related to an important idea. In one case, it is related to the poet's uh, understanding of karma and karma phala. In other cases, in the other cases that we mentioned, the idea is that the poet thinks the in the other cases the poet thinks that uh, when we come to the world we actually have pre assigned roles and some of these pre assigned roles are due to our karma so when we come to the world we come uh, uh, pre we come with a pre assigned task and we perform 
we, 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 we perform that role in the world as an actor acts on the stage. The actor has no control over the story. The story has been given, the dialogues are given, the actor only has to enact uh, the role. He does not create anything. He, whatever he has been told, he does. Similarly, the world is a stage and we come with a program, with almost a program that we are supposed to do this and that is what we do. So, this uh, so, so, so this is one of the, this is something which the poet believed in and he implements this vision uh, through these episodes. And the third one is that uh, probably there are multiple traditions and uh, of uh, composition of, of the composition of Mahabharata and different poets uh, were named as the authors of the text. So, viewed thus, we find that these stories have been incorporated quite harmoniously into the, uh, into the retelling. So, they are connected in an organic manner with the text and they are not, uh, they do not seem like, uh, uh, you know, they, they do not seem like unwelcome uh, uh, incorporations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.